Well, good afternoon and welcome again to the house of our God. A special welcome to those who are visiting with us. It is good for us to worship together in the house of our God. Before we begin our worship service this afternoon, we'll sing a versification of Psalm 138. We'll turn to 138a. We'll sing with all my heart, my thanks I bring. 138a, we'll remain seated to sing the stanzas. Let's go to gather to our Lord in silence, asking for his blessing upon our worship this afternoon. Let's go before our God in prayer. And so, O Lord, may the words of our mouths, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please rise as we're called to worship. 
Our holy God calls us to worship with the words of Psalm 41, verse 13. Let this be the confession of your heart and mine this afternoon. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. We enter into God's presence, confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship our God with the words of Psalm 46a. 46a in the Trinity Psalter Hymnal. We'll remain standing to sing stanzas 1 through 4 of 46a. Faith in the Lord our God, using the words this afternoon of the Apostles' Creed, we confess our undoubted and Christian faith for the church in all times and in all places. So, beloved, I ask you this afternoon, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We come to Lord's Day 32 in a moment. We transition from the salvation section of the catechism to the good works, the great, the gratitude, the service section of the catechism. To prepare our hearts and our minds, we'll meditate briefly upon 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll be reading verses 11 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. This is page 966 in the Pew Bibles. We'll be reminded once again that our good works are never the grounds for our salvation, they're never the reason for our salvation, but they flow out of our salvation, that God would be glorified. And we hear these things summarized beautifully in 2 Corinthians 5. As the congregation hear the word of God himself. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For we are beside ourselves. If we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all. And those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though once we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake, He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. And beloved, notice the glory of the gospel. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Everything that we are today, everything that we do in service of our God is is not any reason for us to boast. It is God's glory, because in Christ we are new. In Christ we are new creations. By the Spirit we are being molded and conformed to the image of our Savior. Where then is a place for our boasting, our, our glory for ourselves? It is nowhere. To God alone, to Christ alone, to the Spirit alone be the glory. Let's respond in praise with the words of number 465, number 465. We're being seated to sing, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Number 465, remain seated to sing.
as those lost in wonder, love, and grace. Let's go before our God in a time of congregational prayer. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we confess with the psalmist that truly you are good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But Father, we confess with the psalmist that as for us, our feet had almost stumbled. Our steps had nearly slipped. We were envious of the arrogant when we saw the prosperity of the wicked. Oh Lord, we know the sin that crouches at our door. We know the ways in which our our minds and our flesh cry out to do things their way. Call us to live for self. Call us to glorify self. Call us to indulge our our selfish desires and our selfish wants. And Father, we we see your call to holy living upon our lives as uh, something difficult, something that is oppressive. We look to the arrogant and the wicked. We see them prosper all around us. We see the world encourage them and applaud them. And and Father, we begin to get frustrated. We despair. We lose hope. We, We begin to complain against you. But Lord, we thank you that by your spirit you come and you wake us up. You open our eyes. You open our ears. You work upon our hearts. When our soul was embittered, when we were pricked in heart, we realized that we were brutish. We were ignorant that we had acted even, O Lord, like like the beasts towards you. And yet you have promised that you are continually with us, that you hold our right hand, that you guide us with your counsel, that one day you will receive us into glory. O Father, whom have we in heaven but you? May it be that in our hearts we desire nothing on earth, nothing in heaven besides you. Our flesh and our hearts may fail But you are the strength of our heart. You are our portion forever. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the the place where we go to buy bread and to receive water without money, to be filled, to be satisfied, to be made new. And so, Father, come visit us by way of your Spirit that he would work within us. That, Father, we we would hate more and more the sin that is within us. Oh, Father, you are gracious even in the ways and in the timing in which you reveal our sin to us. For if we fully always knew the extent of our sin, oh, Lord, we would despair. But we ask that by your grace and by the power of your Spirit, you would reveal to us the ways in which sin remains within us, the ways in which we indulge the flesh, the ways in which we choose ourselves and our own desires in which we go after the world and its ways instead of going after your ways, desiring to to be like you, desiring to glorify you. Oh, Lord, open our eyes to see. May we remember that we died with Christ, and so the old man was crucified with him, continue to bring to life the new man, help us to fight against our flesh and and to take joy in the new creation that we are through Christ. For, Lord, you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. You are the giver of life. In you, we live and move and have our being. And so, Father, we thank you not just for the gift of the new spiritual life that we walk in by your grace through your power. We thank you for the gift of of new life in the flesh. And so, Father, we we celebrate with, with Rob and the gift of two new grandsons. We thank you for Samuel and for, for Oliver. Oh, Lord, we especially bring Samuel before you and the complications that have gone on with his birth. Oh, Lord, be near to him. Be near to his parents. Grant little Samuel strength. Grant wisdom to the doctors as they tend to his need and grant his parents patience and comfort. And we ask the same for Rob, for it is not easy, oh, Lord, for us to look upon our children or grandchildren and to to see them suffer, to, to feel helpless. But, Lord, we know that you see all things, you know all things, that you are the one who is sovereign. And so we place Samuel in your hands, continue to nurture him and grow him and heal his his little body. And, Lord, we thank you for the healing that is ours in body and in soul. We thank you for those who bring that good news to the corners of the world, who who proclaim that news in faraway lands. Oh, Lord, today we especially think of the missionary whom we send out, Reverend Corsea in Bucharest, Romania. Father, we thank you that you have brought many new souls into their church, many disciples, many who are 
who are curious about Jesus and desire to follow him. And so we ask that you would pour your spirit out upon them, that you would speak to them through the word preached, that you would work through the hands and feet of, of the fellow congregation members, that these, these new believers would be, would be discipled and encouraged and brought along in the faith. We also thank you, thankful for the outreach they're able to, to do in their community through their upcoming conference. We ask that you would grant uh, that you would grant that this would be a, a time of, of renewal, a time where where many new believers are, are are hearing of Jesus Christ and are drawn to the church. Oh, Father, do this that you would be glorified, and we ask too that you would watch over Reverend Cosera's wife and family, especially his wife Lydia, as she expects a little baby girl due, due in, in August. Father, grant strength and protect Lydia and, and protect this, this little child whom you are knitting together. And Lord, we know that you know the end of it, and so we place them in your hands. And Lord, we think too of the, the church that has persecuted our, our brothers and sisters around the world who who are, who are ready to take, to take persecution and, Father, even, even death for the name of Jesus Christ. We think of the ways in which they are persecuted by, by, by violence and even, oh, Lord, by financial means. We, we think of Belarus and, and the charges that were, were laid against Christians simply for, for arguing for the truth of the resu- resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we ask that you would grant them strength to to, to hold to the good confession, which is theirs. Oh, Lord, that you would provide for them and for their families and the loss of livelihood and wages that even as we were reminded this morning, we depend on you for our daily bread. We depend on you when, when times are good and we depend on you when, when times are rough and difficult. And so, Father, we, we give you our dear beloved brothers and sisters far across the globe. And Lord, as we would open your word, grant us your spirit that he would be with him who speaks in all of us as we hear that word. Open our ears to hear, our eyes to see. Soften our hearts that we would, we would receive the word. And oh Lord, that we would live by it and be encouraged by it and enter in, into a new week serving you, knowing, as the catechism reminds us, that we were sinners, but we received salvation through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, by this new life that is ours, may we live serving you. May we live lives filled with gratitude for all that you have done, continue to do, and will do for us. Oh, Lord, we ask these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. Before we open the word, we'll sing together a song of preparation. We'll turn to number 119E, 119E. We'll stand, if you're able, to sing all the stanzas, 119E.
thinking as we transition from uh, grace to gratitude or salvation to service in the catechism, we speak of good works, their place, their source, their, their goal in the Christian life. To do so, we'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read verses 1 through 10. Our text will be verses 10, and we'll also touch on several other passages in Scripture. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, this is page 976, 976 in the Pew Bibles. Hear now the word of God himself. And you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's why the reading of God's holy word, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Please also turn in your forms and prayers books to Lord's Day 32. Lord's Day 32, we'll be looking at page 237 here, beginning with question and answer 86. Question and answer 86. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? The answer, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also renewing us by his spirit into his image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits and that he may be praised through us. And further, so that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. Over to the next page. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like, will inherit the kingdom of God. That's for our catechism reading this afternoon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, called to be saints, one of the reasons that we read the law of God every Sunday is so that we are reminded that it is impossible for our salvation to be dependent on our works in any shape or form. The Sermon on the Mount has made that all the more clear. Blessed are those who mourn, Matthew 5, 4. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied, Matthew 5, verse 6. A scripture reading reading reminds us right off the bat that we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we once walked. Also that we were all once lived according to the passions of our flesh, that we were by nature, it's who we were, By nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Ephesians 2 and 1 through 3. That was our nature. We were children of wrath. You can't change your nature. Dogs can't decide to be cats. Cats can't determine to make themselves into lizards. Men can't transition into women. And sinners, beloved, can't make themselves righteous. Children, I want you to think about it this way. 
Let's say you go into the garage with your dad to work on the car or the truck. Maybe you go into the bathroom with your mom to do that Saturday cleaning. Either way, you're going to take a rag, and once you're done with dad, that rag is going to be filled with grease and gunk and grime. If you're done in the bathroom, that rag is going to be gross and smelly. What if you take that greasy rag? What if you take that smelly, filthy bathroom rag and throw it on the counter? Let it sit there for a week. That rag going to suddenly change into a clean rag all by itself? No, that's impossible, and it would be silly for us to even think that. And so, too, it is with our sin. It's silly to think that somehow, as people hear as the passage says who are dead in their sins and trespasses, it's silly to think that we could make ourselves clean and righteous before God. No. There is a reason that the rules for sacrifice in the Old Testament always called for a spotless, clean, and healthy creature to be laid upon the altar. God expects, God accepts nothing less than absolute perfection. Our hope is that God, outside of ourselves, comes to us and creates something new, glorious, and beautiful. He makes us alive together with Christ, not because we earned it, but because of that great love with which he loved us. That's the gospel promise. So congregation, our theme this afternoon will be this, as as those redeemed by the blood of Christ, we walk in new life through the Spirit. As those redeemed by the blood of Christ, we walk now in new life through the Spirit. We'll take this up under two points. First, the source of our good works, and second, the purpose of our good works. The source and then the purpose. So again, we have to go back to that three-letter word again that we spoke of this morning, sin. Sin is, as we said, an impossible debt that we cannot pay. It's a crime whose penalty is death. It's an act of rebellion, an act of hatred towards God. It's like us taking that rag we spoke of and coating it in oil or bathroom filth. If you try to wash the dishes with those rags, children, let's say you take that shop rag, that garage rag that you worked on with your dad and take it into the kitchen to wash the dishes, your mom's not going to be too happy. She's going to send you back to rewash all the dishes with a clean rag. A dirty rag is a dirty rag. As I said, we're at the point now in the transition in the catechism. We've moved from sin and then misery, sin and misery, which the law of God shows us, unto the salvation that is ours, won by Christ alone, received by faith alone, where we were cleansed by Christ's blood, reconciled to the Father, given the gift of faith by the Holy Spirit. So now we, we move on to the third section, our response. Sin, salvation, and now service or guilt, grace. And now gratitude, if you like the G's better. So again, notice the order, knowledge of our sin, the call to look to God alone for salvation, and now the response. Still, perhaps, even after working through these first two sections of the catechism, our sin and misery, our guilt, we're still left with that question. Since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? What's the place of good works in the Christian life? Jesus has done it all. Jesus paid it all. All my righteousness comes from him. What's the place of good works? It was a good question to ask. In fact, this was a key question in the Reformation. It was one of the charges that the Roman Catholic Church threw into the face of the Protestants. Their teach, they said about the teaching of the gospel according to the Protestants, they, they, they said, well, doesn't your teaching of the gospel, that there are good works, that they merit nothing? Doesn't that make people indifferent? Doesn't that make people wicked? Take your books. Go back to question and answer 64, Lord's Day 24, if you'd like. But beloved, Scripture itself answers the question. Paul anticipated this exact objection to the gospel. 
You know Romans 6 well, don't you? Romans 1 through 5, Paul talks about the fact of human depravity, that salvation is by faith alone and God's sovereign grace alone, through Christ the second Adam. And so he anticipates that Roman Catholic, really that human, that fleshly objection. Turn with your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, verse 1, page 942. Paul knows what's coming after he preaches the gospel. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You see, congregation believers struggle in their Christian lives not to fall into one of two ditches. Which ditch is it for you? First, there's the ditch of legalism, and then there's the ditch of antinomianism when it comes to our salvation. What do we mean by these? What do we mean by legalism and antinomianism? Well, on the one side of the straight and narrow path, we have the idea of legalism, where someone believes that, well, even if I have received my salvation by grace alone through faith alone, well, I have to keep it or I have to increase it by my good works. Christ got me in, I stay in by my good works. Well, then on the other side of the road, you have antinomianism, which Paul here in Romans 6 is speaking directly against. And and this is where a Christian thinks that because Christ is my righteousness and because he won salvation for me, well, they're the self-fulfilling prophecy of the Roman Catholic. If Christ is all these things to me, I can live as I please. Anti nomos, anti-law, against lawism. I don't care about the law. Christ is all my righteousness, therefore it doesn't matter how I live. But beloved, what is the problem with both of these? There are really two problems on two different sides of the exact same coin. Why? Because both divorce good works from God as their source. Both make the source of good works me. Both make the center of my works or lack thereof me. One says, I work hard apart from God to please God. I work hard apart from God to please him. The other says, I am a law unto myself apart from God, and I will do what I please. I'm a law unto myself. I'll do what I want apart from God. I'll do whatever I want. Both of these ideas are anti-Christian. Both of these ideas are lies. What does our text say, congregation? After proclaiming the wonders of the gospel of grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, Paul comes to the place of good works in the Christian life, finally. And it's neither legalism nor antinomianism. Go back to our text in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I want us to notice two things right away. First, that word creation As one who has received the grace of God in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a new being in him. And second, your walk walk changed. Did you catch that? That change in the passage, we began with the walk. Go back to verses 1 and 2 of of our our scripture reading. We We were the walking dead in our sins and trespasses. We were following the course of the power of this world, the spirit of the age, Satan, following his path. We were carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, walking down my path. 
that I have chosen. But the Lord says to those who are in Christ, no more. Now you are God's workmanship. You are a new creation. So children, think about it this way. Do you like to put models together or put Lego sets together? How does that work? What do you do when you put maybe a model plane, a model car, build a Lego set, set together? You, well, you begin with a plan. You know how that model is going to look. You have a desire for that. You have an end that you're working toward, and the same is true of us as believers. We are models in God's hands. Just like we have a plan for how this plane is going to turn out, how this Lego set is going to turn out, we, we mold and shape it and fashion it, put it together. We're God's workmanship. We're God's craftsmanship. He's putting us together. He's shaping and forming us. Just as you take great care in putting a Lego set together piece by piece, so God takes great care in crafting you to be like his plan, his son. He's crafting you to be the man, the woman, the child he's called you to be. The author to the Hebrew sums it up this way. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12 with me. Page 1008. Hebrews 12, beginning at verse 1, reading through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And beloved, notice how, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God, of the throne of God. The Catechism summarizes it beautifully in question and answer 86. What is the place of good works in our life? Well, Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also renewing us by his spirit into his image. And so then notice that this goes back to that sovereignty that we talked about this morning. God is not just interested in merely redeeming us from our sins and then sending us on our merry way. No, congregation, he's also interested in making us new, every single part of our lives, every thought captive for him. How do we begin the catechism? We love that first question and answer. What is your only comfort in life and in death? What's the very first thing that we confess? That I am not my own, but I belong body and soul to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't belong to me anymore. I don't do what I want anymore. I'm not the old man that I was anymore. I belong to Jesus. Part of the gift of the entirety of our salvation, the fullness of our salvation, is that new life that is ours in Christ. This, beloved, think about it this way. This is one of the ways in which, verse 7 of our scripture reading this afternoon, one of the ways in which God shows the world the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When the world looks at you and sees you, does it see someone who has been treated with the kindness and mercy and compassion of God himself? Someone new. Someone not depending on themselves. Someone glorifying God. You see, we are clay in the potter's hands. Jesus is not just the author of our faith. He's the perfecter, as we saw in Hebrews 12, too. And we mean by that that he alone can bring us body and soul to his planned, intended goal. So that means, congregation, secondly this afternoon, that God gets all the glory. We move from the source of our good works, God himself, to the purpose of our good works, God's glory. Legalism says, I can boast in what I'm doing for God. See what I did? Antinomianism says, I can boast in what I am doing for myself. But Christianity says, our salvation is not our own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. 
Paul says in Romans 3, verse 21, that the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. And then he says in verse 27, well, then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So then how do we work through this? Where's the payoff? Where does the rubber meet the road? We know our tendency to slip into those two ditches, the ditches of legalism and antinomianism, trying to win favor with God, living for self without any gratitude. But the second half of question and answer 86 beautifully summarized the God-glorifying, God-centered purpose of our works. We read that it was because Christ redeemed us by his blood, but he's also, hear this, renewing us by his spirit into his image so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, that he may be praised through us. And further, so that we may be assured, by our, assured of our faith by its fruits and by our godly living, our neighbors may be won over to Christ. But like we said, when we read the law, this is not just about a checklist. Even as we work through those, that list of, of benefits of, of the good works, the God's workmanship in us, we come to the, 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 even that idea about the, the fruits, the fruit of our faith, that we're assured by them. But, but Pastor, I, I struggle with that. Sometimes my fruit is pretty stinky. Sometimes my fruit is a bit rotten. Beloved, we're not saying that the fruit of our faith is the grounds for our salvation. We're not saying that the fruit of our faith is the reason for our salvation. No, not at all. We're saying that when we see fruit in our lives, we admit that that could not have happened were it not for the grace of God. When I spoke to my wife with more gentleness yesterday when I was tempted to be short-tempered again, it was the grace of God. Wow, I was, I was able to flee that temptation. I've been fighting that for months, and I finally was able to flee it. That was God's work. Give him the glory. My goodness, when I was driving home with Sammy on the way from school, I was actually patient with his endless questions. It was God's grace. I had no desire to even participate in the gossip session over coffee yesterday. It's because God's grace is at work in your life. I had that desire to stay away from the gossip, to, to be patient with Sammy because I'm so good and holy. No, because I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Because my salvation is by grace through faith and is not my own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that I can boast. Because I am looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of my faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised its shame, and is seated now at the right hand of God. It's because of him. It's for his glory because I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that I should walk in them. I am new. I have a new path before me. Not a path that I'm walking so that God will receive me, but a path that I'm walking because God has received me. He sends me on the way. He strengthens me on the way. He makes me new on the way. Therefore, to him be all glory and honor. And yet, which one of us wouldn't say that there are times when this is a struggle? Which one of us doesn't read question and answer 87 and have a moment of pause? Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and unrepentant ways? By no means. Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, 
thief, a covetous person, a drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like, will inherit the kingdom of God. We've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. If you've looked at a woman with lust, you're an adulterer. If you call your brother a fool, we're murderers. Is that me, Pastor? Well, beloved, I would say to you, if you don't care a whit about question and answer 86, Christ having redeemed us by his blood, if you don't care, if you couldn't care less about the beauty of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 and, and hearing of the way that the Lord has, has made us new and because of the great love with which he loved us, so if that is unmoving to you, you don't, just don't care, then yes, beloved, be warned. Today is the day to repent and to believe that the precious blood of Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all your sins. But if you hate the sin that remains within your flesh, if you desire to live more and more and more for Christ, if you desire to be more and more and more like the one who shed his blood for you, well, then you are his workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God himself, your heavenly Father, prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So take great comfort and hope in being sure, being convinced with Paul. Ephesians 1 verse 6, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Beloved, you belong to Christ. Nothing will snatch you from his hand. He will bring to completion his good work for his name's glory and honor. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are not our own. We've been bought at a price. Our only comfort in life and in death is that we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. We are your workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that we should walk in them. Oh Lord, we have died with Christ. Our sinful nature was crucified with him. We are alive now with Christ. We are seated with him in the heavenly places. We are the objects of your mercy and grace for the world to see. And so, Lord, help us to, to live in that way, to live filled with thankfulness and gratitude for all that you have done. Let it be seen in the ways in which we speak to our family members, in the ways in which we, we, we conduct ourselves in our businesses, in our, in our dealings in the marketplace, in our dealings in the, in the, in the shopping in the shopping marts, at the gas station, on the road, in our interactions with our unbelieving family and friends. O oh Lord, be seen in the ways in which we, we live before your face. And so, Lord, may we reflect your glory. And when, and when people wonder why the difference, why the change, O oh Lord, may we give you the glory. May we point to Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. May we point to you, whose workmanship we are. We point to the work of the Spirit who has given us new life. Oh Lord, we ask these things that you would be honored and glorified. We ask them through the precious blood of Christ shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. We ask them in the power of the Spirit who has made us new. Amen. Let's respond with the words of number 482, our song of application. Number 482, In Doubt and Temptation, if you're able, we'll stand to sing.
Once again, we give of our tithes and offerings for the work of grace reform through our budget, as well as for the discipling efforts of the Langanoons in Honduras. Let's get together today with cheerful hearts. For doxology, let's go again to Psalm 46a. We'll sing stanza 5, God is our refuge and our strength. Let's praise the Lord with one heart and one mouth as we stand to sing 46a, stanza 5. Enter into a new week with the blessing of your God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.